Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks for the privilege and blessing of being able to come together to worship and glorify you. We ask you today to, to be with Father Jim, that his words are your words, that our minds and our hearts be open to the message you would have us here, and that the transformation of our minds continues in small ways. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Please be seated. Today should be interesting. As you probably read in the, uh, in the bulletin, we're going to be talking about women's role in church and uh, some of the controversies around it. But before we start, I have a little gift for Marie. <laughs> Yeah. Before we dig into this, I want to first talk about uh, the principles of interpretation of Scripture, which is technically called exegesis, which is a word I haven't used maybe but a dozen times since I got out of seminary. Basically, this exegesis is how you look at Scripture and how you interpret it, how you apply it to your life. The important thing for us to remember about biblical interpretation, about exegesis, is not to take one verse out of context and build an entire doctrine on it. The interpretation of our scripture, whatever passage we're looking at, must agree with all of the rest of scripture. That's an important qualification to make before we dig into this. First, Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says, This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, there have been people that looked at that and said, Oh, that means everybody's going to heaven, right? No, it doesn't. Because when you look at that in the context of the rest of Scripture, you see that there is a heaven, there is a hell, that people have a choice, that some will be saved and some will not be saved. So we can't just take one Scripture and build an entire doctrine on it. So let's start at the beginning, Genesis. In Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now I want to take a look at the Hebrew behind this phrase, behind this verse. The Hebrew word helper here, the phrase implies strong helper. Okay, it's not a position of submission. It literally means one that surrounds, ones that protects, aids, helps, or comforts. Begin to see that, that this was not, God did not create women to be in a role of submission. Then God says, fit for him a helper fit for him, which in the Hebrew means the opposite, specifically a counterpart or a mate. Now, the interesting thing about this word helper also, going back to helper, is the word ezer in Hebrew. It occurs 30 times in the Old Testament. Two times it refers to Eve, the woman that was given to, God, to Adam. Three times it refers to general populations or something of that nature, but 25 times it refers to God himself. So if we apply that concept over this scripture, we see that woman was created to stand next to man, to be a comforter, to be a protector, to be a strong helper, to be a mate. There are even those who teach that when Adam was created, somehow he had the female and male attributes or whatever. I, I, I don't know exactly how to say this. And that when God created woman, he took the female part of Ad, out of Adam and created Eve. I don't know if, if I can go that far to say that. It's an interesting thought. But man and woman are meant to stand together, to support each other. One is not to be over the other. One is not to lord over the other. They're to be equal, supportive. They're to help each other. You okay? I refer to the twins here. 
Okay. <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> God created us to be free, men and women, male and female. He did not create us to be slaves to each other. He created us to complement each other, particularly in the role of husband and wife, to make a whole, two halves making a whole. He created both male and female, and his nature is revealed through both natures, through both genders. Now to our tough verse this week. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 to 35. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in churches. I have another peep here for you to read. <laughs> there you go. You got one for each hand. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. Bite the bullet. Um, and continuing. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. We need to look at this passage in context of the entire epistle. What is Paul talking about in Corinth? The church was in chaos. It was a crazy place. This church is, in verse 33, we the church is known for its lack of order. They were not doing things in an orderly way. People were prophesying all over. They were not exercising control. They were talking over each other, probably shouting over each other. Everyone in the church service was participating with whatever way they desired. There was no order. There was, there's examples of several people speaking in tongues at once with little or no interpretation. And the pastors were not exercising control over the service. It was chaos. It was a zoo. And certain women in the Corinthian church were adding to the disruption by asking questions during the service. Now, we have to also understand the role of women in that society. Women had been pushed down. Women at that time were considered but pro as property by some they were not in a position where they had any kind of uh, authority or even honor in some cases. So also in the synagogue, women were separated. I don't know how far that separation was, but they certainly were not given the education that men were given. So all of a sudden, the church comes, and you have men and women sitting together. And the women are going, why are they doing this? What's going on here? This is what Paul is saying, is that asking questions during the service was disruptive. Find another place to do it. Ask at home. Get your information there. We're here now to worship the Lord. That is what this is about. Better? <laughs> Paul is saying, don't interrupt the service. He's addressing church services that were out of hand. This, the, the role of women in society even went so far as in pagan temples, women served mainly as prostitutes. What a horrific thing. So now women are being saved, they're coming to church, and they don't know how to handle themselves. The church different from the pagan temples, was a place now where women could prophesy. They could take an active part in the worship. They could pray out loud. Jesus came along and upset this Hebrew tradition that had developed over a couple thousand years. And so I want to look for a little while at how Jesus related to women. John 4, the Samaritan woman. Jesus broke a bunch of rabbinical laws here. 
not biblical laws, but rabbinical, rabbinical laws. He started a conversation with a Samaritan woman in public. Number one, she's Samaritan. Number two, she's a woman. Rabbinic oral law of the time says, he who talks with a woman in public brings evil upon himself. One is not so much as to greet a woman. That's why the disciples came back, and they're amazed that Jesus is talking to a woman. And think of how stunned she must have been. Here's this Jewish guy coming up, and he's breaking all the rules. He's talking to me. I've been ostracized in the first place. And here's this Jewish guy coming up, breaking the rule that I'm a Samaritan, number one, number two, that I'm a woman, and he's talking to me and inviting me into the kingdom of God. But Jesus is not concerned about the rules. Jesus is concerned about the woman. Women were among Jesus' closest friends. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus entertained him at, his, at their home. Now here in our gospel reading today, Martha was assuming the traditional female role of preparing the meal. Mary did what only men would do. She sat at the feet of Jesus and she absorbed his teachings. Now Jesus, by teaching Mary spiritual truths, violated another rabbinic law which says, let the words of the law, the Torah, be burned rather than be taught to women. If a man teaches his daughter the law, it is though he taught her lechery. Now, mind you, this is rabbinic law. This is not scripture, okay? So Jesus was turning the tables on society. He was elevating women to the position that they belonged next to men. In the book of Acts, we read about women being deacons in the church. Phoebe was a deacon in Romans 16.1. There were women prophets in the Bible. and In the Old Testament, there were seven of them. In Exodus 15, we read about Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. She took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. What was she doing? She was leading worship. She was leading worship. And then there was Deborah, who was a prophetess, wife of Lepidoth, who was judging Israel. And Isaiah's wife. Isaiah says, and I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. There were, peop there were women that God had elevated in positions of authority, even in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Anna is mentioned in Luke 2. Remember, Jesus, or Joseph and Mary bring Jesus to the temple to have him circumcised on the eighth day, and Anna prophesies over him. There are four more prophetesses mentioned in Acts 21.9. They're all through the Bible. Now, a question for us to consider when we look at Paul's epistle to the Corinthians is in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that women can pray and prophesy and preach. And if he does that, why in chapter 14 would he tell them to be quiet? See, there's a conflict there. That's because he was addressing the rowdiness in church. In Joel 2.24, we read that it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. You see here that spiritual gifts are given to women as well as men, equally. They are to be utilized in the church. God has poured his spirit upon sons and daughters, men and women in the church. Why would God do that if women are to be silent and submissive and downtrodden in the church. He wouldn't. In Pentecost, at Pentecost, in Acts 1.14, we read the disciples and all those with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They were all together, worshiping and praying together. The women were taking an active role. 
And we can look at the evidence now of women preaching. We can look at Beth Moore, at Joyce Myers, Anne Graham Lotz, Billy Graham's daughter. And then there was a woman named Maria Woodworth Etter who had an amazing ministry as a healing evangelist back in the early part of the 20th century. Now, I will admit their ministry, except for uh, Maria Woodworth Etter, is primarily to women. But there are men that sit under their teaching. It's important for us to understand that God places people in positions of leadership because of the gifts that he has given them. Spiritual gifts, physical gifts. The gift of, uh, I'll use this word cautiously, but charisma. The gift to be able to communicate, to draw people to them. Women as much as men. Now granted, these women, they minister more effectively to women than others. That's natural. Ginny ministers more effectively to women than I do. Why? Because she's a woman. She understands things that I can't understand. That's why we need female leadership in the church. These women, Joyce Meyer, Beth Moore, Ann Graham Lotz, the, the list goes on. Why would God bless their ministry if they were somehow sinning by speaking in church or by teaching men? The Bible endorses women in leadership also. In 1 Timothy 2.12, Paul seems to limit women's role in the church leadership, but he had praise for the women who served with him as deacons and co-laborers. There was Phoebe, there was Junia, Priscilla, who helped lay foundations in the early church. In Philippians 4, Paul expressly expresses solidarity with two women leaders whose names I cannot pronounce. <laughs> Other women led churches, such as Chloe and Nympha. So the, the point that I want to make this morning is that we need to look at the entirety of Scripture. We cannot build a doctrine simply on one verse. If, and, and as we look at that verse, let's say that, we, that women shall not speak in church. We look at that verse, we have to make sure, we have to look at other verses in the Bible that speak to that same thing. And if this seems to be in conflict with the other parts of the Bible, that's when we dig. That's when we ask the Lord, okay, what are you, what are you saying here? And that's where we find gold, is when we really dig. That's when the Lord, I find the passages that are the most difficult when we dig is when the Lord reveals the most to us, is when we get the greatest treasure. Our interpretation of Scripture must agree with all other Scriptures. And we, when we read the Bible, we must be willing to set aside what we think or what we want the Bible to say and let the Bible read us. I think we're all guilty of that as, you know, we want to prove our point, so we go to the Bible and we look up verses that reinforce what we believe instead of going to the Bible and asking God what his truth is. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> I, this, I am so nervous, I can't believe <laughs> I'm usually very comfortable up here. <laughs> she was praying. I know she was praying. Let's, uh, let's conclude the sermon with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, we thank you for the gift of woman, the gift of women, especially in the church, Lord. We know that you have placed women here to be co-laborers with men, for us to work together for the advancement of your kingdom. We thank you, Jesus, that you elevated women, that you created this revolution to elevate women to stand beside man, to that place.
place of, of equality with men. And Lord, we ask you now that um, to give us greater revelation into this truth. We ask, Lord, for parts of the church that have shunned or, or uh, put down women or any ethnic or racial group or whatever, Lord, that you would show them the truth. We pray, Lord, for the gift of repentance. We pray for your spirit to be upon us. And Lord, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we bless every woman in our lives, particularly the women in this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.